Hi, I'm John Niehaus, Director of Program Development for the National Association of Flight Instructors, welcoming you back to another episode of the NAFI More Right Rudder Podcast, the podcast for flight instructors on the go. And today I have a very special guest. And uh, before I get into who he is, let's talk a little bit about why we're here. So over AirVenture um, at the NAFI Member Breakfast, the uh, Flight Instructor Hall of Fame inducted their newest inductee for 2023. And that individual is Lieutenant Colonel Bill Powley, U.S. Air Force, retired. Bill, welcome. Thank you, Don. So... For Again, for those that aren't familiar, this is kind of an elaborate process. Um, it takes all year to collect applications, to review the nominations that have gone in, and uh, to find sort of the right person um, to induct each year. I have the privilege of being what's called the chief administrator of the award, um, which is outside of sort of my general capacity for uh, for NAFI because you don't need to be a NAFI member. You don't have to have any affiliation with NAFI whatsoever. Um, and it's judged by uh, some, some really great uh, industry leaders. Um, those leaders are, we've got Greg Brown, um, who is from Helicopter Association International. We have Colonel Julie Tizard, uh, and she is uh, U.S. Air Force retired, but also a uh, airline pilot. We have Tom Turner from the American Bonanza Society. Brittany Tuff, who is a uh, director at uh, Women in Aviation. Um, and we have the prolific author um, and aviation personality, Barry Schiff. You probably know him from uh, from all of his time with AOPA. So it's uh, we've got some pretty heavy hitters uh, that uh, look through each of these packets each year, each year. And uh, Bill, this was uh, this was your year to shine. So congratulations. Thank you very much. That is a quite a nice group and what an honor to be on that list uh, of the previous 35 or so inductees. That's a. Uh, like I said, from Tennessee here, we're all familiar with uh, Mama Bird, Evelyn Bryan Johnson, and uh, Bill Kirshner. And so it's kind of crazy to think that my name is alongside those. Yeah, you know, and it's you're the second uh, person in a row to come from Tennessee. So, um, you know, I guess good things are happening here in Tennessee. This is sure seems now, like it. They say, yeah. You know, there's a, there's a lot that goes into this from a background standpoint. You know, one of the requirements is that you have to have at least 20 years um, in the industry in flight training. Um, and of course, you've got uh, well more than that. And uh, I'd like to get a little bit uh, into kind of your background, because all of this is what kind of brings you to this point. Um, and I think that you have quite a, an interesting story, both with the military and, and as a civilian. Um, when did you start flight instructing? I started flight instructing in 1974 in the A7 at Myrtle Beach. Uh, I went to pilot training in 1967 and became a flight instructor for the Air Force A7s in 74. And then throughout my career in F4s, A7s, and then dual current in the T-38, I was kind of a check pilot flight instructor just in the squadron and things like that. Not necessarily a big flight school, but just doing it as a part of my like your additional job description for uh, uh, being the administrator of the Hall of Fame thing. That was kind of an additional job I had in addition to flying missions was to help uh, check pilots out and uh, kind of like a stand up out guy. Yeah, you know, and and uh, as an aside, one of the things that we were talking about in some of our previous conversations is just the the number of missions that you have flown in uh, or did fly in in the Vietnam uh, theater there, it's it's really high, isn't it? Well, I don't know where that puts me in the top 5%, 10%. Uh, a lot of people in the Air Force flew a lot of missions over there. So uh, I had uh, 347 F4 tour and an A7 tour. And as I said in my Hall of Fame speech, uh, I am so blessed and privileged to be able to be doing this because at age 24, I could have not been here. So every day is a is a gift to me. Well, and it seems like you've made the most of it. So um, fast forward through uh, some of the the instructor missions that you did in Vietnam. Did you? How long were you with the military after the the combat was over? 
Well, I told I was a total of 23 and a half years in active duty in the Air Force. And then I taught 22 years Air Force Junior ROTC. And with my four years at the uh, Air Force Academy, when I retired in 2013 from teaching, the Air Force had paid me 50 years to wear the uniform. And I figured that was a nice round number to retire on. <laughs> yeah. How did you get into junior ROTC? The airlines wouldn't hire me. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I was a, a fighter pilot and I was not current. And at that time, there was not a shortage. So I actually got hired by Com Air uh, in their pilot pool. But in the meantime, I threw my hat in the ring to teach Air Force Junior ROTC. And they hired me here at Unicoi County High School in Tennessee, which I didn't even couldn't hardly find it on the map, Irwin, Tennessee. And uh, that's what started this program that I have fortunately been recognized for is when I interviewed with the principal. Uh, I think I was about the seventh or eighth interview they had for the job and the unit was on probation. And I said, why not? I had just gotten my CFI uh, at Eglin Air Force Base and ATP before I had retired through the Eglin Aero Club and uh, never thought I would use it. But uh, I said, why don't we fly these kids, get them excited about something and help. Maybe that'll save the program. Well, that was the story I told about one vote making a difference. The school board voted four to three to have my flying program as part of the JRTC curriculum in the high school. Six years uh, later, we were an honor unit and uh, we're an honor unit every year after that. So the flying really did make an impact on exciting kids, uh, having them join JRTC and making the program very viable. Now, so for those that aren't familiar, what does honor unit mean? It It's the top, uh, I don't know, maybe 10, 20% units in the country. Excellent. So, wow. yeah, you just, uh, we went from being on probation. Uh, six years later, we were an honor unit. And the reason was not too many units were flying kids. And that just put us like right up in the stratosphere with what other R JRTC units were doing. And it if I'm a if I'm a kid or or maybe a parent of of somebody, um, what's the requirement for for getting into something like that? You know, what what do you look for in candidates or cadets? Basically, uh, people who want to be there. Um, units basically have some different challenges with kids being dumped in there, maybe, and don't want to be there. So the best units are the units that is a uh, cross section of the whole school. Hmm. Interesting. And so that then segued into a more civilian uh, career. So what did you do beyond that? Well, the, the interesting thing is how this started is we had no money, of course. And uh, what we did was we would take three kids up, fly for about an hour, take aerial photographs of nice homes of businesses around the Unicoi County area. I'd come back and spend hours, uh, this was back before digital, and uh, have the film develop, have pictures blown up, put together a portfolio, go to the house, spend an hour or so and say, hey, we just did this. Would you donate $100 for the kids? Most people will donate money for students, not for me, but for students. And so we raised actually uh, $8,000, 100 bucks a pop, to taking aerial photographs. Uh, an interesting story is that uh, I looked up some magazine, someplace said that uh, NASA Ames Research in California was helping advance education in aerospace. So I called uh, Mark Leon in California and said, Mark, we've got this program here in Unicoi County. Can you help us out? He said, nope. Uh, six months later, I called him up and said, Mark, said, we still have this great program. Can you help me out? He said, nope. Six months later, I'm pretty persistent. He, I call him up and he says, you're not going to quit calling until I give you money, are you? I said, mm -hmm. nope. So he gave me $10,000. And that is what really started the program because now 
we didn't have to raise money on flights and we could fly instead of three kids in an hour, we could fly nine kids in an hour, eight or what, you know, three, three in a flight, 15 to 20 minutes. And so our productivity just went tripled, basically went out the roof. And that got us the attention of the Tennessee Aeronautics Division, which then gave us grants for 15 years. And like I said, without money, I'm just another spectator at the airport. And so we've raised about $2 million over the last 30 years. And uh, that's what's led to us flying over 12,600 kids in that time. And and we basically give $5,000 scholarships for private pilots. Uh, and it, it's, and now with the shortage of pilots, I just have a lot of kids that are interested. And so far, knock on wood, we have never turned one kid away uh, that has been interested in taking the program and doing the solo and private pilot part. That's incredible. Uh, so one of the things I think we we may have skipped ahead here a little bit. Um, so you... You got your initial funding, um, and then that ended up creating your flight foundation, um, which is flight lesson instructional grants helping teens, correct? Yes. We did that and in 1998 because uh, we most of the big corporations and stuff couldn't donate money unless you were a 501c3. So mm -hmm. we did that just so we could accept funds, and, and that's been – we get funds from uh, FedEx. Uh, we get funds from the Ray Foundation, which I know you AOP does. A lot of people do. They're they're great, and and of interest, I've worked with uh, Chuck O'Hearn for about the last three or four years, and I got to meet him for the first time at the induction ceremony. That really? Cool. Yeah, yeah. So we were really looking forward to that. <laughs> That's incredible too. We can now put a face with the with the with the uh, sound on the phone. <laughs> So, so let's go and let's talk about these statistics that, uh, that you brought up and I've got some notes here. Um, now I, I'm assuming these numbers are out of date, so forgive me, but, uh, over 11,000 over probably over 12,000 now, uh, students you've flown on, uh, over 4,300 orientation flights. It's um, about 4,600 now and about 4,500 flights. And that's wow. what the foundation has done over those years. Uh, I do most of it. I'm a one man show, uh, basically. So I have flown over 10,000 of them myself, which is quite a lot. Yeah. Yeah. That's... <laughs> over how many years since you said 92? Since 92. Right. Wow. And, and we started out, you know, flying 10 kids a year, 40 kids a year back in the first six or seven years. We've ramped up now to where we average about 600 or more kids a year on orientation flights. And we do them from 26 different high schools in Upper East Tennessee. Um, most of them all are Navy, Army, Marine, or Air Force JRTC units. But I also do a lot of other units, uh, not high school units, but summer camps like Girls Inc., uh, Langston Center, um boy scouts any organization that knows about me or wants to contact me i will try to set up a uh a flight for them I, I try to get at least a dozen people to come to the airport because the airports are far away and by the time you pre-flight and post-flight and do everything uh i want to get a couple of flights in <laughs> rather mm -hmm. than one flight so and that's what makes it work is that the schools will bus students in uh and if they bus Back in the heyday, when I had other people helping me, I think our biggest year, we flew over a thousand kids that year, and I'd have a busload of 40 some kids come. So I get another instructor. We use two airplanes and we get all those kids flown in about three hours. Now doing it myself, they bring about 24, 27. Um, and I'll get those guys done in, you know, in two and a half, three hours. Probably my biggest flight was when I went to, I actually went to Chattanooga. I do a school down there called Hickson High School. And uh, I went down there to get checked out at the Collegedale Airport in one of the new 172s. It has about 14 some points on it, you know. And uh, the first day it rained. So all I got was a local area checkout. So in two days, I flew 83 kids. 
I had 28 flights in two days. <laughs> I don't necessarily advocate that, but that's what it took to get the job done. Yeah. Are there uh, are there any students? I, I think as an instructor myself, I, I remember you know all of them. You've had a lot more than me, so I'm sure you know there's there's some that are more clearly defined in your memory than others. Um, but are there any students that you really sort of look back on and and consider kind of a, a success story of the program? Somebody who's really achieved some pretty incredible things. Oh yeah, I mean. Most of them have. I've sent uh, I've sent eight students, solo students, to the Air Force Academy. Uh, a lot of them go to MTSU, Middle Tennessee State University, where they go in their professional pilot program. Uh, I just talked to one student about three weeks ago, A.J. Vines, who uh, went out and uh, was flying locally at the Tri-Cities Airport, and they went to uh, commuter and now i think he's with american as a uh, first officer and he's making 200,000 a year so that's pretty cool and and there's others like him uh, one of my students that i just soloed in 2018 went to mtsu he's back here at the greenville airport now helping me fly my students as a flight instructor building time to go to the airlines so they're all kind of in the mix and uh, at different stages uh, I don't necessarily hear from them all the time, but I, I've got them on my phone and I can call them up anytime I want to and say, Hey, how are you doing? <laughs> what, yeah. what are you doing? Yeah. No, you joked that, uh, you know, you, you started this because the airlines weren't hiring at the time or, or didn't hire mm -hmm. you, but at what point did you really kind of realize that this was your path? How did you, how did you, you know, see in yourself that all of this could be achieved i didn't it's uh it's kind of like my air force career it was just kind of uh, one one day at a time one step forward and so you know you can look at me and see that i'm not getting any younger and after 30 years i mean when you, when you do this uh the numbers just start building up and i just apparently uh I'm as excited to go to the airport today as I was when I started flying in 1967. So that passion has just always stayed there. Uh, I don't need to fly another hour in my life for me, but I can't quit doing it for the kids because yeah. the kids come back from these orientation flights. And as they're getting out of the airplane and their instructor is there at the door, those three get out and another three get in and I'll stay in the airplane until I have to take a bathroom break or something, I may get eight or nine flights in a row and just do the turnaround. And they say, this is the neatest thing I've ever done in my life. <laughs> it's hard to quit that. <laughs> mm -hmm. So it it kind of grabbed me. I don't know that I grabbed it. It's just kind of, I kind of fell into it because part of the thing I said, I think was that in the Air Force, I avoided assignments to flight instruct and teach in a school that's i took the f-16 over that assignment how ironic it is that i have made history so to speak as a teacher and a flight instructor so i guess god had a different plan for me i i didn't know what he knew what i wanted i didn't know what i wanted so i mean that is really a a great story i avoided those things in the air force and here now i've been doing it for a living <laughs> You know, it's funny. I've done a lot of interviews and, um, you know, that tends to be something that does come up uh, somewhat regularly. There's a lot of the some of the best instructors that I know are individuals that didn't really see that originally as their career path. And once they started it, they got kind of the 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 bite. And, and here they are, as you said, many years later. Um, you know, loving every minute of it and and continuing to to affect the the, the change. Well, and I, when I taught high school for 22 years, I'd always tell the kids, I'd say, just find something that you're passionate about and you'll never have to go to work a day in your life. I don't care whether it's being a nurse, a doctor, a teacher, a pilot or whatever. If you can find something that really excites you, the worst thing you can do to that person is make them not go to work, is keep them home. You know, they want to go to work. They want to be where they're working. And that's what I want to do is I want to go to the airport and be there and go fly like I did this morning. And I think my solo this morning was like number 200 and 
69 or 70 or something like that. So wow. The soul on these kids on their 16th <laughs> birthday is just is just a thrill. It really is. And speaking about piloting, there's an article that just came out in the paper today in the Irwin record here about my induction. And the guy asked me, he said, when did you, uh, how long, when did you first learn you wanted to fly? I said, well, I really didn't as a kid. A lot of these kids go, uh, they all these pilots, oh, I, since I was six years old, I wanted to be a pilot. No, I just wanted to be a baseball player. And it wasn't until I got my assignment uh, or acceptance to the Air Force Academy. When I went there, you know, I looked around and I said, well, I'm in the Air Force now. What do Air Force officers do? Well, they fly. <laughs> so my first time actually piloting an airplane was at pilot training for the Air Force. I had never flown one before that. Hmm. So, yeah, I'm not the story about, you know, soloing on my 16th birthday or, you know, looking at something and saying, oh, I want to do that for the rest of my life. It, it literally has been a mantle that has been put over me through no fault of my own. <laughs> or no you know no uh no great vision of my own except one of my classmates at my 55th reunion which was last year at the academy said you were born to fly hmm. i thought that's probably true <laughs> although i didn't know it at the time well, you know, sometimes those are the best uh, success stories is when you when you do find that one thing that you might not have considered originally and, and it just becomes a, a passion part of your life. Right. So back in 2010, you received the uh, A. Scott Crossfields Aerospace Science Teacher of the Year. Tell me a little bit about that and, and how did that come to be? Well, uh, I called Sally Farley when I got this induction notice from you and, and Paul. And I said, I owe this all to you. Uh, she is Scott Crossfield's daughter. And the Crossfield Award, now back in 2010, there probably weren't that many aerospace science programs in high schools. They have really started generating now in the last three, four, five years. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like I've been a pioneer in that arena. Uh, so again, I was nominated for that by my first solo student, Seth Bennett, uh, who is now a colonel in the Air Force. He's one of my students that went to the Air Force Academy doing really well, not as a pilot, though, but still, he was my first ever uh, solo student. And his dad, Fane Bennett, is my accomplice in flight foundation he's not a pilot too but he is a really smart guy and a good people person and he he does most of the schmoozing and stuff and and working the working the, the issues but uh yeah so so that recognized again i got the award just like i did for naffy but or for the hall of fame but it was such a team thing. I mean, I'm the leader of the band, but there's hundreds of people that support this. And that recognized us as the top aerospace science program in the nation in 2010. And literally, you have just recognized us again for the second time as the top aerospace science program in the nation. So that's pretty cool. And and well earned. And, and I'm going to just go through a couple of these accolades. Of course, we've got the... Uh... The, the A. Scott Crossfield Award that we just talked about, and that's done by the National Aviation Hall of Fame. Um, you received an award from the Tennessee Aviation Hall of Fame um, to recognize you that same year as the Tennessee Aviation Person of the Year. Um, and uh, let's see here. We've got uh, Career Contributions to Aviation Awards. Um, and you were inducted, actually, into the Tennessee Aviation Hall of Fame in 2013. So this is... Uh, um, we, we, as in the flight instructor hall of fame are, are so, uh, grateful to, uh, to have you as a part of our program too. Cause I mean, it's, it's incredible what you've been able to achieve during, uh, during this time. Um, I'm humbled and I mean, it's just nothing that was on my radar, you know, I mean, I didn't set a goal out to be inducted into anything <laughs> and uh, sure. So, well, I, so, and those are the best ones, right? Like when, when it, it just sort of right. happens. Right. Right. 
<laughs> the um the other part of your application that was uh, very interesting, we hadn't seen this before, was that uh, um, you also had it had uh, part of your nomination represented from part of the Tennessee State uh, House of Representatives. You had a, a representative write in for you. Wow. How do you uh, how do you go about meeting representatives from your state? How does this happen? Well. I, like I said, I had a grant from the Tennessee Aeronautics Division for about 15 years. So that got me into the Nashville crowd. And and Rusty Crow, who is the senator here, I've known him for years. And, and I don't know when that first introduction was. It may have been through another friend and Erwin Tom Reeves. Um, but anyway, uh, when the Aeronautics Division stopped giving us money, Rusty and I worked together to try to get a budget item, a line item in the, in the state budget. And we were successful in doing that three years ago. And we've done it every year since then. So he loves the program. He's a Vietnam vet. Um, so we have a, a little commonality there. And uh, I'm just, again, I'm just blessed to be able to have some friends that can help me navigate. Like I said, this is a team effort. Uh, there's a thousand people that should be on that trophy <laughs> uh, that made this thing work, and uh, it's it's crazy. But uh, yeah, it's nice to have friends like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, and uh, there, I guess there's two because we also received uh, information from a uh, Mr. David Hawk as well on your behalf. So yeah, David Hawk is the representative for Green County, where the Greenville Airport is that I've been flying at for 30 years. And so he's known about the program forever. So when I put the full court press on to make the application maybe a little bit more robust uh, for this year, I got kind of all those people that I could think of that knew about the program that really liked it, that could say something meaningful and, and say, this is, this is something really special. Yeah. Yeah. So one of the unique things as we start to wind this down, one of the unique things about the award is, is that the, there's, there's sort of two main trophies. So the one trophy you get to keep, um, and that's one that we develop for, for each of the inductees uh, year after year. And the other one is what we call our traveling trophy. It's a, uh, it's a wooden trophy and it has some plates on the side and a wing that comes out of the top. And I like to equate it as similar to the Stanley Cup. And if you're not familiar with that, although I think most people are, um, the Stanley Cup is basically it's every year they add the names for the previous recipients onto the cup so that the cup stays consistent. It changes. Um, but, you know, there's a legacy there. And and that's what we wanted to build with the the Hall of Fame trophy is, is that every year the new inductee has their name on the front. And then when it's time the next year to update the trophy, to have a new induction ceremony, that same trophy returns back to us. We take the previous year's uh, recipient or inductee and move them onto a larger plate uh, on one of the sides of the trophy. Eventually, we're going to end up on the back. <laughs> but uh, uh, that moves onto the side and then the new one goes on the front. So we're, we're, we're adding to the sort of uh, history of, of this trophy. And, and we've been doing this um, for, let's see, I think that trophy was created back in, I believe it was about 2014. So we've been doing this for a while and um you know it's it's a really neat thing to be able to build stories with this and you out of i think out of any of the inductees that uh, that we've been able to do this for i think you've you've got some really big uh big travel plans with this uh you've already taken it to your i think you said physical therapists yep um and uh you know i'd love to have you explain a little bit where that connection is but uh um, you know, you, you've got a lot of plans for this and we're really excited to be able to kind of follow and, and see where this thing goes. Cause I think that's what, uh, that's what this is all about. Right. Well, and, and I think that is a great idea because right. The first group I gave it to were my physical therapists that I've been going to for 30 years and they've kept me healthy and, and out of pain and all kinds of pulls and tears and and total knee replacements got me back up on my feet quickly so 
like I said, I'm I'm basically the only pilot in Flight Foundation, and so if I'm not flying, nobody's flying. And so I've been very blessed to only be down maybe a, a max of three or four weeks, getting back into the into shape and recovering from knee surgeries and all this kind of stuff. So they're they're a big part of it. The trophy right now is sitting at the Greenville Municipal Airport, which is where I do most of my flying, and we're having a photo op there uh, Friday morning at nine o'clock with. Well, hopefully a dozen or two dozen people that are instrumental in helping me as I'm flying down there, the airport manager, the line people, uh, other pilots, other instructors. If I have trouble with a student that I'm not getting through to them, I'll let another person take them for a sanity check. Or if I if I think maybe they're not going to, they shouldn't be in airplanes, rather than just saying that nah, we're done, I'll let another person fly them. And if they say nope, I don't see it, then, you know, I hate to ruin someone's dream of flying unless it's uh, more than just my opinion. And so we'll take a picture there. But of interest, with all those names on the plaque, this will this will tell you you're on the right track. Uh, one of the guys there named Walt Stone, who used to be the airport manager back in 1970 or something, he comes to the airport all the time. He's uh, He just hangs out there. He loves uh, being there. And he looked at the names on the plaque and he says, you know, he says there are four other Tennesseans on this plaque. So he read all the names. He looked and and I said, yeah, who knew Tennessee is the Mecca for, for flying. <laughs> but uh, no, so that's uh, I think that's a nice thing. And so from there, it'll move some other places. Uh, I've already got a photo shoot with uh, my my doctor who I've been going to for 30 years um sponsors uh, i've got a list of about 14 or 15 other places that i want to take it um probably get senator crow you know i mean people that have really been instrumental in uh in helping me out i probably if it was lighter and smaller i would travel with it because this september uh, i'm going to a wolf fact reunion vietnam reunion in uh, fort worth texas and uh, it'd be pretty neat to take it there and get a picture of all my fellow wolf facts with that trophy. But I'll have to I might take the smaller one <laughs> since it's later and do that. But I mean, the case can be shipped. I Yeah, no, I, I know but that's, <laughs> that's a lot of work for a one day event. Yeah, that's uh, I don't want to lose it. But there's enough people around here that I think we can get a nice uh, nice sampling of all the people who have helped me. One of my thoughts is. I have it for a year, so each time a school comes to fly, like the 600 kids a year, when I get those schools there, I'll take it there and get a picture of the school with me holding the trophy. Because they're, again, part of the reason I've flown 12,600 kids. The school's showing up at the airport. Yeah. Oh, and well, if I may start a rumor, um, yeah. you I'm know, the, the that trophy has been earned by some some very uh deserving individuals yourself included and you know maybe there's a little bit of luck imbued in that trophy maybe those uh if the students just kind of do a little bit of you know <laughs> touch the trophy maybe they'll maybe they'll get some aviation luck who knows that's right osmosis yeah but uh no that's uh you'll have some pictures i hope <laughs> i love it I love it. Well, um, in in sort of uh, my final question to you, this is kind of something that comes from my old uh, 10 question series. But for somebody who is just starting out in the industry, or maybe their their eyes are focused on on getting into the industry, um, you know, if you could give them one bit of advice for for success in the aviation profession, uh, what would it be? I guess the one thing would be to not do things that are over your capabilities um we all we all think we're invincible uh most military pilots have to think that because people are shooting at you so you don't go in there thinking oh this is my last day or i can't do this or i can't do something so pilots as a general breed are i can do this kind of people and i've told the story to other people of uh one of the things that gets you in trouble is get their itis, right? Mm -hmm. So I was flying a T-38 with a friend of mine uh, from Carswell Air Force Base where the F-16 was being produced. 
to Eglin Air Force Base for a weekend cross country. And we were coming back Sunday night and uh, the typical line of thunderstorms from Louisiana up to Maine, you know, goes across Texas and everything, goes up to about 45,000 feet. And so we see these things in front of us and we're talking to the controller and uh, I, there's no radar in the T-38. If I had an F-16, I'd have probably made it because I could find my way through the weak spots in the storms. And I was a safety officer. And so I had read a lot of reports, people trying to over climb over thunderstorms, stolen out, you know, doing all that stupid stuff. So we're climbing up and I'm talking to my back seater there. And I say, Harry, what do you think? You know, should we try it? Should we not try it? It was probably a very gut wrenching decision to turn back. Almost like admitting failure. We didn't make it. We had to go back, but I'm still here. Whether we could have made it or not, I don't know, but it was just one of those scenarios that didn't seem to be putting the odds in our favor. So we went back to Eglin, spent the night, went there the next morning, and everything was good. But I can just remember the machinations going through my mind about, ah, I don't want to turn back. <laughs> I really don't want to do this. You know, <laughs> I want to get home. The family's there. This is stupid. But so that. That probably is one of the tougher things is to admit that you can't make everything happen that you want to make happen. Hmm. Come back to fight another day. It's good advice. And and also weather flying. I mean, you know, if the weather, like I wanted to solo this kid uh, Monday, it won his 16th birthday that I soloed today. We went up three times, point one, point two, and point one or point two hours. Went in the pattern, rain showers in the area. We landed. Well, it looks pretty good. We went up. Well, the clouds are at uh, scattered at 800 feet, but we're in the clouds because it's a little more than scattered maybe until we land. We try, attempted it three times and finally said, you know, here's another one of those situations that I'm not going to put you in a danger, especially as a student with, you know, 10 or 12 hours. I'm not going to put you in a dangerous situation. We'll just do it another day. We did it this morning. The weather was beautiful. He's a happy camper. Hmm. Disappointed that he didn't do it on his 16th birthday, but you know, he's got another 80 years in front of him that hopefully that won't make a big deal to him. Right. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, it gets good advice. And uh um, you know, I if somebody wants to learn about uh the flight foundation, where would they go? Well, they can go to our website, which is www.flightfoundation.com. Uh they can certainly call me on that website is uh i think phone numbers and emails and everything else to get in touch uh so my email is uh bill powley 45 at gmail.com and uh i'm certainly interested in talking to and helping anybody that uh, needs help it is pretty much a regional program you know i don't have students all over the country i think there's other programs uh other scholarships that take care of a lot of that, but uh, I'm very happy to talk to anyone about it. And if I can help them, uh, I certainly will do that. We basically do, like I said, a $5,000 scholarship for a private license, which nowadays is getting up to be even in East Tennessee, which is one of the cheaper areas, 10 to $12,000, just normal for a private. Some go 15, 16, 17, depending upon how many hours the student takes to get it. And the weather and uh, whether they fail to check right the first time or not. <laughs> yeah. Well, Bill, I appreciate you taking the time today. Um, certainly congratulations on your uh, much deserved uh, induction. And I am uh, truly looking forward to seeing the adventures that you have with the trophy and uh, the pictures that come with it.